Welcome to another of our Deeper Look videos. Uh, as a reminder for all of these videos, uh, and I probably won't say this after this one, um, all of these videos have this special structure where I am drawing as I talk, and I encourage you to draw alongside me um, the different diagrams or ideas that we're exploring. Uh, you can add in your notes anything I say in particular that feels like it is useful and relevant to your understanding. A lot of what I'm going to say is uh, stuff we have seen in the lecture videos but are trying to explore by creating a diagram or organizing our thoughts in some particular way. So let's get started. We're going to be talking uh, in this video about the ecliptic and uh, seasonal change. So I'm just going to write seasons, but it is going to be mostly thinking about that in the context of our, um, of our sky. And I want us to recognize that um, first we have seen a prior uh, Deeper Look video, or we have access to a prior Deeper Look video, uh, where we are um, exploring the celestial sphere model, thinking about how stars move over the course of one single day. We are now going to be thinking about um, how stars change over the course of a year, but we do not want to lose track of the fact that every single day the Earth still spins on its axis, and so stuff rises and sets um, in our view. Okay, so when we mentioned the ecliptic briefly uh, in previous videos and previous uh, materials, we talked about how the ecliptic is... Uh, something that we can describe in a couple of different ways. One of them is the path of the sun through the sky, uh, and another is the plane of the solar system projected into our sky. What we're going to talk about today is using the plane of this light board. Uh, we are going to talk about the uh, solar system um, in, in that context, or rather we're going to be talking about the ecliptic in that context, uh, the plane of the solar system, but the plane of this of this light board. So we're going to put the sun in the middle. I'm not going to try to indicate its size. Um, the sun, although it is, it is quite big, if we are making a model of this size, it, size, it would be too small to see. And we're going to try to think about the Earth at different points in its orbit. So um, we want to recognize that it's not very essential for us to know which way the Earth uh, orbits. But if we are looking at the um, the solar system from the kind of North Pole down, uh, so a top-down view the way that we would think of it in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, things tend to uh, rotate counterclockwise and orbit counterclockwise, um, and that's just, that's just how the, the solar system set itself up. So the Earth itself will be rotating in its axis or in its orbit excuse me, uh, in this general direction. And we don't have to memorize that. That's not, that's not a very exciting uh, thing. But what we do want to recognize is if we choose where we're thinking about the Earth at any given moment in time, so let's say that I'm going to catch it on um, June 21st. If I catch it on June 21st, one of the important things about our um, calendar is that every June 21st, the Earth will be at that spot in physical three-dimensional space. So we can add some stars, and I'll add some stars here in a couple of different places. Uh, and I'm not doing this just for fun, although it is kind of fun, but also to be able to use them to point back at uh, in just a little bit. So I'll add some in a couple of different places. Don't want to forget this part of the sky. And we want to recognize that um, there are stars everywhere. One of the important things that we want to really recognize with this model is that there are stars um, behind the board where I physically am. So I wore um, stars uh, just for that purpose. And there are stars on the other side um, where the camera is that uh, we would have to draw in space. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have magical powers or a magical marker. Uh, so I can't fill this actual three-dimensional room with stars, but we want to recognize that they are there in all directions. Because one of the important things for us to recognize is on June 21st, if I am on Earth and I am facing this direction, it's going to be daytime. So this is our day view in that direction. 
and in that direction there are a whole bunch of stars. However, the sun is there making it too bright for us to see any of these cool stars. So these are out in the sky during the day, um, but if we were to look at night, uh, we would see these stars instead. So this would be our night view in June. So I'm going to just target a set of stars uh, that are going to be um, almost in this plane, close enough for us. Uh, we're going to have a patch of sky here that we're going to pretend is the constellation Orion. And Orion is not perfectly in this, um, in this plane, but it is pretty close to it, so we're going we're gonna to rely on that. And what we want to recognize is that um, if we wanted to see Orion, June is not the right time for that. Orion is not a summer constellation. The summer constellations would all be here, where we might have the summer triangle, things that um, an asterism that we will um, talk about in class, uh, and other constellations that are familiar to the summer skies. Orion would not be easily visible for us on June 21st. Instead, if we wanted to look at Orion, we're going to have to wait six full months and come over here. Um, so this would be the day view for us. This would be the night view. And recognize we've got a big, we've got a big view. I can see most of this room uh, that's in front of me, not just directly straight ahead at the camera. And this June 21st, if we were wait to wait six months, we're now talking about December 21st. So Orion is very easily visible at, um, at winter time. So um, easily viewed, easily viewed in winter. And I picked these dates special because December 21st is the start of our winter, June 21st is the start of our summer, and Orion stays very easily visible throughout all of our different winter months. So um, we want to recognize that if our nighttime sky had these constellations in June, and now it has these constellations in December, there are changes that have to be happening every single month and every single day. And those changes are based on the fact that for us to get to a day on our clocks, a day on our calendars, the Earth is not just rotating once in place, so viewing the camera, back to viewing the camera. Instead, the Earth is making sure that it is facing the sun. So I'm going to choose one of these lights. That's the sun. But the important thing is, is I have to each day take one step also. So for me to go from facing the sun to going around and taking a step around that light, I have to turn extra to go back to facing the sun. And that extra uh, time it takes for us to look back at the sun again is four minutes, which means that every single day, stars will rise and set a little bit earlier by four minutes. So stars rise and set four minutes earlier, earlier every day. And that everyday part is important because this is just a consistent, smooth process. They're not just like ticking over to be in a new spot. It is this consistent, smooth process that the stars are just kind of misaligned with our clocks because our clocks care more about the sun than the other stars, which is a bummer for them um, and for us maybe. But it means that if you add up four minutes over the course of 365 days, you get a full 24 hours worth of change. And if you only add up four minutes for six months worth of change, you get a 12 hour difference, which means that Orion is rising and setting 12 hours differently than it did um, six months ago. And this is why our stars change over the course of the year. The other thing that's important about drawing this and being able to have this view and talk about the ecliptic like this is again, I am 
drawing on this um, glass here, and it is a specific plane of stars. If I have a star group here, that is not perfectly aligned with the sun uh, in June, nor is it perfectly aligned with the sun in December. It's back over here in three-dimensional space, which means that um, there are still going to be times of year where it is more easily visible, less easily visible, but it is not going to be directly behind the sun. And so we might be able to catch it at sunrises and sunsets at different times um, than we might expect. So the other thing to note here um, is the fact that if we were to um, count up all of the different constellations that are along this, um, this glass specifically, there would be um, 12 to 13 constellations that are perfectly lined up with the sun. And I already noted that Orion is not perfectly lined up, so we're going to pretend that it's kind of back behind the glass a little bit, um, but is a good one for us to be able to point to, easily visible from uh, downtown at the right time of year in winter. Um, but what we want to recognize is that there are 12 uh, to 13 constellations that are fully lined up with the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Those constellations we refer to as the zodiac, except for the one that we ignore. Um, and those constellations are familiar to any of us who are interested in astrology and star signs and horoscopes. Uh, and I want us to recognize that those are the constellations that thousands of years ago were lined up perfectly with the sun. So if we were born on June 21st, we would think about what constellations are back here. Orion is not in the zodiac because it's not perfectly lined up with the ecliptic, but it is um, nearby Gemini. And so um, it might be Gemini, I don't remember offhand because uh, I teach astronomy and astrology. Um, it might be Gemini that's here behind the sun um, when you're born in June. And those uh, would be the signs then that you're getting um, on those particular birthdays. And in December, we look and we are um, close to Scorpio or Sagittarius. And uh, those are based on the ecliptic. It is based on which of our 88 different constellations are lined up with all of the places that it seems like the sun is able to be aligned with. So from June, we would go to July and August, September, October, November, December. And in those different viewpoints that we're seeing, it would be those constellations that are perfectly lined up with this plane, this glass plane that I've drawn here. Okay, so setting aside the zodiac, that's a less important topic for us. We wanna now think a little bit more about seasons. So one thing I have not drawn here is the earth with any real detail. I'm gonna try to do that now. Um, so the earth has a tilt that we talked about and in June, this tilt, this is the North Pole of the um, Earth, is tilted towards the sun. And that same, that same tilt, so here's the, um, the equator of the Earth, that same tilt carries over, so it's tilted like this. We're not tilted towards the sun or away from it. So here, three months after June 21st is September 21st. And then again, three months later, we have December 21st, and we are tilted away from the um, we are tilted away from the sun. So the North Pole points away from it for the Northern Hemisphere. And then we have the Earth here, where again we're not tilted towards or away; we're kind of tilted sideways. Uh, and this would be the South Pole. This would be the North Pole again. And this is um, March 21st. And these particular dates uh, can be offset by a day or two, depending on exactly uh, what time of day, kind of crossing over midnight um, or not, uh, as well as leap year. But this is kind of on average in our calendar um, when they tend to show up. And so these are, let's label them. This is the summer solstice.
And because that North Pole is tilted towards the sun, the sun is higher in our sky and it is in the sky for longer. So it sets in the Northeast and it goes through high in the Southern sky and it sets in the South, uh, in the Northwest. On September 21st, um, notice that we're not uh, aligned with or misaligned with this, the sun at all. So we have, um, this is the fall equinox, so fall or autumnal equinox. And equinox means equal night. We have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime, and that's true for everybody around the globe on the fall equinox. Uh, the sun on that particular day would rise perfectly in the east. It would set perfectly in the west, so due east and due west. December 21st is our winter solstice. And again, note that we are pointed away from the sun. We have shifted the sun so that it is lower in our sky. It will rise in the southeast. It will go low in the south sky, and then it will set in the southwest. So that's the shortest day of the year. And then March 21st is our spring or vernal equinox. And again, equal night. Um, that's our other day of the calendar year where we have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime. So um, these different specific dates, the fact that they are places where the um, Earth continues to show up year after year in physical space, which means that every December 21st, Orion is easily viewed high in the sky. Um, and every June 21st, it's these stars that I haven't really named um, that are uh, in easily viewed at night in June. Uh, and that's true, we could go through for each one of these. And um, if you're taking a lab with me, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about seasonal constellations uh, in, in the lab. But otherwise, that is the main things that I wanted us to think about. So what the ecliptic means um, and the fact that these seasonal moments in time are places physically on our um, path around the, around the sun. And that that lineup happens the same way every single year because of our calendar. The last thing I'll note for the stars rising and setting four minutes earlier every month, uh, we also want to recognize that somewhere in this plane is also where the moon is going to be found. So um, let me draw for September 21st. The moon is also going around the Earth. And in Module 2, we'll be talking a lot more about the moon and moon phases. And this circle is a little bit offset. So it would, um, if I could, like shift through the glass. Um, part of that circle is ahead of the glass and part of it's behind. So very rarely are they actually fully lined up in the same plane, um, but they tend to follow the same overall path, only offset by a little bit. And if we extended this out, um, this model, we would eventually get to all of the planets, which are also nicely aligned with this, um, with this glass plane. Uh, and so all of the planets would be found somewhere along that same path that the sun appears to take that the zodiac constellations are found in. And that is the ecliptic, which is why it is so valuable for us to understand, not just as a term, but what it means for looking for uh, the moon at night or looking for planets as well. So thanks for watching. Um, I'll go off screen so that you have everything you need uh, to copy down what you would like to, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.